beginning at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, as we look at this, I want to develop from where we were the last time I was with you. And that was how the Apostle Paul had been speaking to the uh, Philippian church that they were supposed to have a, a, a life. Notice chapter 1, verse 27 that we had conduct that was, as he said, worthy of the gospel, worthy of the gospel of Christ. So Paul has been exhorting the church to walk worthy of the gospel. That word worthy, as I was mentioning to you when we looked at it together, is a word that means that which is suitable. It, it speaks of that which is appropriate. Uh, it means that which is suitable or worthy of something. And so the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we walk worthy of it, it simply means that our life is going to, to be appropriate with the message. If the message speaks in a certain way, then our lives are going to line up with that. And so what the Lord would have for us to do is to walk worthy of the gospel. It's similar to what he said in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where Paul said, You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and he goes on to say, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And so if I'm going to walk worthy of the gospel, if I'm going to walk worthy of God, well, I have to put away certain things. He had stated here in chapter 2 at verse 3, uh, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So I put away certain things uh, because one of the things that matters, and it matters the most really, is that if I'm going to properly reveal what the gospel does, my life is going to be changed. There's going to be an evidence, in other words, that I have a relationship with God, and therefore there's going to be no selfish ambition. There's not going to be strife and contention in my life. There's not going to be any conceit. That word conceit speaks of empty boasting. I'm not going to be making the world revolve around me. I'm not going to be the center of every conversation. I don't need to be the topic of everybody's lips, the things that they speak about. It doesn't have to be about me. What it has to be about is Jesus Christ, and instead of... of, of of conceit and ambition and all of that, pursuing things for my own gain, wanting to be known and recognized, wanting to be popular, wanting to be the one that people look up to. Instead of that, what's going to happen is, is I'm supposed to be and we're supposed to be walking humbly. We're to consider others, he says, as superior to ourselves. Notice verse 4, let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so as an evidence that I'm walking worthy of the gospel, I'm not going to be doing things to selfish ambition or conceit. I'm going to have humility. I'm going to be considering others better than myself. I'm going to be desiring to, to look out for other people instead of myself. I'm going to see them as superior. And, and I'm going to learn to deny myself so that I might beneficially serve somebody else. Well, when you say that, I mean, there are people who, who hear that and they say, but the problem is, Pastor, you just don't know who I am. You're just not aware of how important I really am. You see, if you really understood how important I am, you wouldn't ever say to me that I should walk like that. Uh, so obviously you're just ignorant of, of my wonderfulness. Well, the bottom line is Paul has an answer for that. And what Paul decides to do is he decides here in this passage under the, the direction of the Spirit is to give the greatest example of somebody who's like that. The greatest example of self-sacrifice, and that example, of course, is Jesus, because Jesus exemplified humility as well as self-denial. Now, many people struggle fulfilling the call to service and sacrifice. They ask the question, how can I become what God intends me to be? So Paul begins here by speaking concerning the way that we think. 
he begins to speak concerning our mental attitude. Notice what he says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He begins with the mental attitude, the way people think. He's saying you need to direct your mind to a thing. You need to seek or to strive for something, and that is a proper attitude. Now, if I'm going to seek the proper attitude, it would be good for me to have an example of someone who had a proper attitude so that I could understand what he's saying. And so obvious, obviously the one I would look to when it comes to attitudes and proper attitudes would be the, the attitude that Jesus had. And it's easy to find uh, examples of that. If you take notes, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, gives us a great example of the attitude of Christ. Because when Jesus spoke concerning himself in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Remember what he said. He said, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. And then he describes himself. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So what was your attitude, Jesus? I am meek and lowly in heart. Now, a lot of times when people see the word meek, they have a problem with the word meek because they see meek and they think it means weak. And that's not what meekness is. Meekness is power that is under control. And Jesus Christ had meekness. He had all power under control. And so when Jesus Christ was walking the face of the earth, there was none like him because of the meekness that he had and also because of the humility, his humbleness of mind. He said, I am meek. Now in Matthew 12, verses 19 and 20, it speaks concerning Messiah in this way. He will not quarrel, or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. Matthew 23, 12 says, whoever exalts himself shall be abased, but he who shall humble himself shall be exalted. So the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you're going to be using anybody as an example, come and learn from me and described himself as one who was meek and who was lowly. That word lowly speaks of that which is of low degree. It speaks of a humility. It's like what Proverbs 3.34 is speaking about when it says, he scorns the scorners, but he gives grace to the lowly. You see, the proud don't come to God with repentant hearts. The proud resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit because the proud, when we're proud, we don't think that we need what God has to offer us. And therefore, we don't come to him with humility and say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. So a proud individual doesn't enter into the kingdom of God because it requires humility to do so. And so Jesus speaks concerning himself, and he says, I am meek, and he says, I am lowly. Proverbs 11, verse 2 says, when, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. So Jesus is meek and Jesus is lowly. And so as we look to Jesus as our model, that's what we see. But he also develops, Paul also develops the immensity of his voluntary humiliation. And I want to show you this as we look at verses 6 through 8. These are very powerful scriptures, and I hope to be able to do justice to them. Quite obviously, I'm not going to be able to do the justice that they deserve but hopefully we'll be able to look at them and gain some understanding of the things of the Lord, especially understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Notice verse 6, speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, I want you to see this, and it's going to take some time to develop this. I hope that you're ready. You might want to relax because I'm going to do my best to give you some scriptural evidences related to who Jesus Christ is. I want you to see this. First, he begins in this way. He's speaking of Jesus, and he says, who being in the form of God, who being in the form of God. What Paul is speaking in these verses about, for those of you who take notes, is he's speaking of Jesus' pre-existence. And he uses four important words that we're going to look at. 
He uses the word being, who being in the form of God. The word being is a Greek word that means always existing. So he's saying that Jesus always is God, always has been God, always existing. This is what Jesus always has been. Secondly, he says being in the form of God, being always existing, form. The word form means the characteristics and qualities that are essential to identity. It speaks of the nature and character of God. It speaks of the essence of something, not simply the external features that identify it. He has always existed in the essential nature of God, is what he is saying. Now he says he did not think it to be robbery to be equal with God. Well, we all know what the word robbery means. Some of us perhaps have been a victory of that, uh, a victim of that. Robbery. Robbery speaks of a thing to be seized upon or to be held fast. It's something that is retained or taken. And then when he says equal, be equal to God, it is a word that means in quantity or quality, substance and nature. Now, I'm giving you these words, being, form, robbery, and equal, and now I'll give you what the intention of the writer is. What is he talking about here? What he's saying is this, Jesus, prior to taking on human flesh in the incarnation, has always been God. There was never a time when he was not God. He has always been God, being in the form of God, being, he said, in the essential uh, nature and character of God. He has always been God. And because of this existence as equal in nature to God, it wasn't a thing that he had to grasp after because it already belonged to him. That's why he didn't uh, try to rob it or grab after it. It's because it belonged to him in the first place. Now, when you read in the Bible things related to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the essential qualities of God and all, uh, there are so many scriptures that you can develop, like Psalm 90, verse 2. In Psalm 90, verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Isaiah 63, 16 says, You, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer. Your name is from everlasting. And so God is presented as being the everlasting God. But in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, in reference to Messiah, it says, You, Bethlehem, Ephratha, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. He's speaking of Messiah, who is always God. Now, why am I making this big case? I just feel like it. Now, the reason I am bringing this out is because there are people who don't understand that, who will actually say, no, Jesus Christ is not God Almighty. He's a mighty God, but he is not God Almighty. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses who present themselves as Jehovah's Christian Witnesses will tell you that. I'd assume most every one of you have had a conversation with the Jehovah's Witness. How many of you have had a conversation <laughs> with the Jehovah's Witness? See, uh, you know, they're very, very successful in knocking on doors, aren't they? How many of you don't open the door? Ah. Uh... <laughs> I've had a number of conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses. I've read their literature, and I've spent time studying things related to them, and I can tell you. That the bottom line is a Jehovah's Witness will tell you that Jesus Christ is not God. A Jehovah's Witness will tell you Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel, the first creation of God. The word Michael in the Hebrew means who is like God. And they will tell you this. I've had numerous conversations. And they will say to you, no, Jesus Christ is not God. He is Michael, who is like God, the first creation of God. And they actually resurrect an ancient heresy that was dealt with in the fourth century in the church. It's history when it related to those kinds of things that were being said even then. But the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus' goings forth has been from of old, from everlasting. But from everlasting to everlasting, the scripture says, 
You are God. So the Bible teaches in the Old Testament that Messiah going forth is from everlasting and Messiah will be God in the flesh. Now in the New Testament, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Now, I bring my Jehovah's Witness example up again. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that, and they have what is called the New World Translation, and they'll open it up to John chapter 1, verse 1, and they'll point this to you, and they'll say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So they add the letter A, and thus make Jesus Christ a God in a pantheon, apparently, of God's throughout the universe, though they would argue vehemently that there is but one God. By adding the word A, they denigrate Jesus from being God in the flesh and make him into simply a great one. But in John 1.14, it says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the point that John was making, and you just need to know the context of the book of John, the Gospel of John, John was writing to actually deal with a heresy that had arisen in the early church called Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a belief system that believed that spirit and matter could not have any kind of real relationship because spirit was good and matter was evil. And so Jesus Christ, they said, who is spirit, could not have possibly taken upon himself flesh because if he'd taken upon himself flesh, then he becoming matter would have been evil. Therefore, because matter is evil, Jesus could not have taken upon himself human flesh. And so the Gnostics entered into the church in the very early portion of it, beginning to say that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh because spirit cannot become flesh. So John, writing to combat this heresy, says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. He wrote that in order that we might know that God indeed took upon Himself human flesh. This one that has always been in the form of God from all eternity has been God, took upon Himself human flesh in what we call today theologically the Incarnation. Now, all of us know what incarnation means because the word incarnation is a Latin word. It's in carne, in flesh. Incarnation speaks of human flesh. Jesus took upon himself human flesh in what is called the incarnation. So the spirit took upon himself human flesh and dwelt amongst us. Jesus Christ, in other words, was born as a human being, but he is God in the flesh. Now, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus had performed a, a miracle. It's recorded in John chapter 5. Jesus had, had healed somebody. But the problem is, is he did that work on the Sabbath day. And so there was a great, uh, great problem over that. And so the people began to be very angry. And in John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, and John says, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews, speaking of the Jewish authorities, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. Now notice what John writes, making himself equal with God. Making himself equal with God. When Jesus ultimately was crucified, when he ultimately died, when the Jewish authorities brought Jesus before Pontius Pilate and were demanding his death, they actually had construed a, a charge against him where that they said this man is stirring up people and he's forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. He's presenting himself as being a over Caesar. And, and when they did that, what they were doing is bringing up secular charges against Jesus Christ. Because when questioned by Pontius Pilate concerning this, and Pontius Pilate discovering that there was no fault in him and, and claiming so, they said, we have a law. This man has made himself out to be God. And that's really the reason they wanted him put to death. So they wanted Jesus to die, not because he was guilty of sedition, 
but because Jesus Christ had claimed to be God. And that's why they ultimately got him to be crucified. And so Jesus Christ, when he said, my father is working up to this time and I am working, they understood exactly what he was saying. Jesus Christ is claiming to be God in the flesh, making himself equal with God. In John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said, The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Just as they honor the Father. Just as they honor the Father. Now, wait a minute. God is to be worshipped alone. When he gave his commands, he said, I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no false gods, no God before me. Yet Jesus Christ is standing there saying, you honor me just as you honor the Father. To put some flesh to that, some incarnation to that. If I stood up here and I said, you are to honor me just as you honor God, that would take about five seconds in this room to be cleared out. You guys would be saying, are you kidding me? I don't honor you. You're a man. I honor God. Now you understand the response to those statements. When Jesus was standing up saying, I'm not a rabbi alone. I'm not a prophet alone. I'm not a good man alone. You're to honor me even as you honor God. What he was saying was revolutionary to the point where people understood it very well. Who is making himself equal to God. You see, Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will give my glory, I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. My glory is reserved for myself, and yet Jesus is saying, You honor me, even as you honor the Father. If he were not God in the flesh, then what he was worthy of is death for blasphemy. And according to Jewish law, that's exactly why they wanted him to be put to death. You see, Jesus did not have to grasp after Godhood because it was already his. Now, all the way back in the book of Genesis in chapter three, we have our first parents, Adam and Eve. And we have that temptation where the, the enemy begins to speak to Eve and, and, and says, uh, well, rather than me just Paraphrasing it, let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. I want to read it to you. Genesis chapter 3. You remember where that is, right? <laughs> no, where is it? Genesis chapter 3. I think you, you'll benefit by just reminding ourselves as we read it. Genesis 3, beginning at verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her stupid husband. <laughs> That's my note. And he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. You shall not die. Well, there's so many things we could look at here. Eve not only gave the word, but she added to it. Because when God spoke to Eve and to Adam and gave that command, he didn't say anything about touching it. He said, you shall not eat of it. But notice what Eve did. She actually added to the word, you know, we're not to eat it, nor shall we touch it. And then she said, lest you shall die. No, God didn't say, lest you shall die. God said, you shall surely die. 
So there was, there was no doubt about it. But notice what the enemy is doing here. He's saying, you shall be like God. Now, turning on back to Philippians, Eve succumbed to that. You shall be like God. She wanted to, she grasped after that. She wanted that Godhood. You see, that's what was motivating Satan himself. That's what Ezekiel tells us, and that's what Isaiah tells us. The five wills, I wills, the five I wills that are found in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, I will be like the Most High. That's what Satan wanted, to be like God. And that which he succumbed to is what he offered to the woman. You shall be like God. And this woman wanted to have that, and she yielded to it. And her husband went along with her. She was deceived, the Apostle Paul tells us. The husband wasn't. Adam understood, but he made a choice. Why did he make that choice? Nobody ever knows. None of us will ever know. Perhaps he felt being with her was better than being with God. Whatever the choice that he made, he made it to the hurt of the entire human family. He made the choice. But you see, she wanted to be like God. Jesus didn't succumb to temptations because he didn't have to. Jesus already is God, and that's a point that he's making. But what does he do? Well, I want you to see in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. In contrast, even though Jesus was God, yet notice he made himself of no reputation. Now, Jesus was already in the form of God. Jesus already was in the likeness. And Jesus was already in that appearance. In other words, he was visibly and fully recognizable as a real human being. Jesus had full humanity, but he also was fully God. And this one who was fully man and fully God did something. He made himself of no reputation is another way of saying he took upon himself human flesh, taking the form of a bondservant. And he came as a human being. But, verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. His humiliation. Now, going all the way back to what I was trying to begin with by emphasizing when he had said in verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. What he was saying in verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In contrast to the willful pride of man, Jesus voluntarily humiliated himself, took upon himself human flesh, and voluntarily yielded himself up on a cross. Voluntarily gave himself up for us. In his human existence, in obedience, he took the lowest place and was obedient unto death. Jesus voluntarily chose the path that concluded with the sacrificial death. That's what he did. You know, there are people who will say, oh, Jesus was murdered or Jesus was martyred. Jesus voluntarily yielded himself. No man takes my life from me. He said, I give it up. Jesus made the decision, he in accordance to the will of his Father and the plan of salvation, to be that Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus voluntarily took upon himself human flesh. Many years ago, I had a friend of mine that I went to church with who said to me that he believes that when Jesus became human, that part of the reason that he was not wanting to go to the cross in the garden when he was saying, Father, take this cup from me, he said it was because he believed it was because Jesus enjoyed being human so much that he didn't want to die. And so there's a Greek word that I used as I was speaking to him. I said, you're stupid. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I'm just teasing. I didn't say that. I thought it. I was a new Christian when he said that. I was a new Christian. I was only three years old in the Lord. But there was something about that statement that just didn't ring true to me. 
Let me think for a minute. Jesus existed from eternity in heaven and joined fellowship in the most perfectly exquisite environment that is so beyond my conception where gold is so cheap it's used as asphalt and precious stones are used for walls and foundations. There is a perpetual bliss, joy, peace, worship. There's no heat that burns you up and no cold that makes you need a blanket. There's nothing but love. But when he got to earth, he wanted to stay here. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Get me out, Lord Jesus. Are you kidding me? I don't want to stay here any longer than he has me stay here. I want to go and be with the Lord. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? Can you imagine? No, of course you can't. Neither can I. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for us. It's beyond us what heaven is. It's beyond us. A place that is so perfect, where colors are so brilliant that they would hurt your eyes if you saw them with the natural eye. Where substance is so real that it's unbelievable. It's so solid and concrete. It's just where there's no tears, where there's no pain, where there's no sorrow, there's no suffering, there's no sin, there's no regret, there's no grief, there's no tears. And I want to come here and stay here. Are you kidding me? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I want to be with you and spend time. Pleasures on earth. Absolutely, God has been gracious to us. He's given us joy indescribable. He's given us blessings beyond measure. He's given us comfort in times of sorrow. He's given us his presence in times of loneliness and pain. He's provided in every single way that any human being could ever really be provided for. But the idea that Jesus didn't want to die on the cross because he liked being a human being could only come from a young man who hadn't really been thinking lately because that's absolutely wrong. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, the scripture says. What was that joy? The joy of being with his father again. The joy of being in the place that he left. That's why Jesus could speak as an eyewitness. He could tell us, this is what it's like. And this is where I want you to be. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you shall be also. And so the Lord, Jesus Christ, when he humbled himself and took upon himself human flesh, it was for the suffering on a cross to pay a penalty for my sin. Because the wages of sin is death. And it's appointed unto men once to die and after this judgment. But God has placed on Jesus Christ my sin. He is the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. He is that sin offering who bore my sin in my place. He has made him to be sin for you who knew no sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself human flesh for the purpose of dying on a cross. And no man took his life. Jesus not only allowed himself to be taken, but even his moment of death was determined because he said, it is finished. And Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And the scripture said, and he breathed his last. And it's another way of saying it. 
and he dismissed his spirit. He said to his spirit, it's all finished, go. And it was done. And he laid his head on that cross like a child would place their head on their pillow before they went to bed at night. And Jesus, into thy hands. And he died. And it wasn't because man murdered him. It was because he came and humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. It's not just the cross, by the way. It's the cross of Christ. Many people during the time of Jesus died on crosses, but we don't look to those crosses, do we? There were two men who suffered and died alongside of Jesus, one on his left hand, one on his right. Their crosses don't mean anything. The cross that matters is the cross of Christ, because on that cross, Jesus bore our sins, and he died on that cross for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Again, I've been paraphrasing this. Let me read it to you. John 10, verses 17 and 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. And this command I received from my Father. And so, verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So after all of this, humbling himself, being obedient to the point of death, dying on the cross, after all of this, God has highly exalted Jesus Christ. Through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, Jesus is the sole individual, the sole name that results in salvation. Well, here's something for you. I was speaking to somebody just today about this. In the history of the United States in recent years, perhaps some even in this room were alive during this period, there's some evil men who have lived and died. Pol Pot, Hitler, Mussolini, Lenin, Stalin. There have been many, many evil men. Mao, the greatest mass murderer, killed millions of Chinese people through that revolution there in forming Red China. Millions of people were massacred. But I was speaking to somebody today and I said, as evil as Hitler was, and indeed, evil, evil man, he killed, estimated as we all know the figures, some six million Jews. Six million Jews. See, the word million to me doesn't mean much. It's just beyond my imagination. I don't know how to figure the word million, to be honest with you. But that's an awful lot. Not one or two or five. An estimated six million Jews. Not only did he in his concentration camps and the atrocities that he perpetrated make sure that some six million Jews died, many times we forget that also in history something like six million non-Jews died in a similar fashion. The amount of massacre was no less than 12 million. What makes it so heinous is the fact that he tried to kill an entire people, Jewish people. So we know that in communist Russia, millions died. We know that in communist China, millions died. We know that under the Nazis, multi-millions died. We know that. 
Muhammad, people pale in comparison when it comes to being responsible for deaths. The estimate is 1.3 billion people follow his teachings right now. I want you to think about that. 1.3 billion people right now follow that teaching, a teaching that's taken them straight to hell. And over the last 1,400 years, multiple millions upon millions upon millions have died without the Lord Jesus Christ. And under Islam, in many of the countries wherever Islam is predominant, is the dominated, dominating religion under Sharia, it is against the law to convert from Islam to another religion. It's against the law to do that. Multiple millions of people are being lost right now. Now, do we understand that? No, we don't. We don't understand that. We don't even think about that. You see, we're so conditioned to see that what Hitler did was evil, what Mao did was evil. Have you even heard about it in your, in your history classes? A lot of times it's not even mentioned in history, is it? So those are physical deaths. But when somebody is responsible for billions of people missing heaven, there's a great responsibility. What I find interesting as a Christian is the Bible, and I want you to see this. I want you to see it. I'll read it to you again. Verse 9, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above some names. That's not what he said here, guys. See, if we're going to be biblical Christians, then we need to go with what the Word of God says. He said it's the name above every name. Every name. And you see, that's what makes Christians so unpopular. That's the truth. If I got on TV and said, yeah, everybody goes to heaven. Even your dog's going to go to heaven. It's a wonderful place. It's open to anybody. I mean, there are a few people you won't see Hitler there, you know. And then people say, yeah, he doesn't deserve going there. You, probably, you won't see him out there. Oh, yeah, he doesn't deserve going there. No, he was, he was a mass murderer. That's true. Um, but when we've had tragedies, when we've had even the terrorist act back in 911, and, and close to 3,000 people perished, and you have all these people saying they're in heaven. That's the common sentiment. Again, I've said this many times to you. It's not popular, but it's true. Today's theology is basically this. All you need to do to go to heaven is die. That's pretty much what people say, isn't it? I mean, one of your popular, you know, one of the popular pop stars who was well known, we'll say, for debauchery, drunkenness, he died of a drug overdose. And they have his funeral, and what do his friends say? Man, he's in heaven right now partying. And let's look up and see him. No, if you're gonna look in any direction to see him, you have to look down, because he's not up there. <laughs> he didn't know Jesus Christ. But see, if you stand up and actually say that, people get upset. They get angry. How judgmental. You know, all we need is love. Didn't our prophets, the Beatles, tell us that? <laughs> I get concerned for the church. I get concerned for the state of the church in the United States. I look at Europe and I see what happened to England the number one missionary sending nation in the history of the world. Some of the greatest missionaries that you read in your books about came out of England. Dr. Livingston, Hudson Taylor, so many, so many hymns and wonderful songs that people sing to this day came out of the, off the pen of a British hymn writer. But when you go to England today, the gospel is being squashed underfoot. Europe is post-Christian. So I look at the United States and I get concerned for our nation because we're mixing, we're mixing up our concern for the state of the nation 
and our hunger for revival, we're confusing that with political movements. And we almost think that we can vote in a righteous leader. And as far as I know, human beings stink with sin. And it really doesn't matter whether the person calls himself born again or not. He's still a sinner. I don't need a sinner. I need a savior. I don't need a president. I need my Messiah. See, so I get concerned, and I hope you don't mind me opening my heart to you at this point here, because as I see the Lord Jesus Christ here, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means something. Might as well get myself in trouble. I haven't been doing Sunday nights for a while. <laughs> yeah, go for it. I'll go for it. And then people will just go. When Glenn Beck had his rally in Washington, I wasn't one who stood up and cheered. I wasn't. Maybe you were. I'm not one who did. I have reservations about it. I don't think revival comes through going to Washington. I think revival comes from getting on your knees. I, I really do. I, I, I see the great awakenings that, that took place in the 1700s and the 1800s. And, and I hear Glenn Beck as he's saying he wants to have a third great awakening. And, and my discernment antenna goes up. And, and I take several steps back. And I say, well, I am in agreement with much of what you say. Well, I, I see the wisdom of what you say, and I do understand the history. I do understand from a political standpoint, and I do understand some of the national history, and I do understand American culture. And I do see how the culture has been shifted and twisted. I do understand all of that, and I, I do hear that cry. The problem I have is I, I'm not going to line up behind a man who is not, not in a religious sense, I'm not going to line up behind a man who's not a born-again believer. I'm just not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that. Boy, I'm digging a big hole. I might as well keep going. <laughs> I... I believe that America is craving release from burdens and unfortunately is beginning to think that we can force it through electing officials. I do believe that when the righteous rule, the people do have a certain amount of joy. I have no doubt about that. Proverbs 29 makes it clear. When the evil one is in rule, the people groan. I understand that. The Jesus movement that birthed so many Calvary Chapel ministries was not birthed as a political movement. It was birthed as a movement of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit grabbed hold of men like Mike McIntosh, who thought his, his head had been blown off by a, a pistol that went off next to his head. It, it, was, it was moved and moved along by, by an angry young man who wanted to kill his wife and kids. It, it was moved along as the Holy Spirit moved a 17-year-old kid who liked to do cartoons and ultimately became an incredibly powerful evangelist like Greg Laurie. It, it happened when, when some guy who had been shot in the leg was laying inside of a gutter and, and some people were pulling out and there's this young man laying in the gutter and they get out of their car and they say, what are you doing and they take him into the house and he gets a bath and they drop him off at one of the Calvary Chapel houses and some young man walks up to this man and says to him, you look miserable, you need Jesus Christ, get saved right now. And that's Steve Mays. A, a, a man is, is, is flying his plane to, to South America running drugs, carrying a forty-five in his waistband. And when he 
arrives in, in Miami, Florida, and he's walking through the airport. There's this Christian witnessing and starts to talk to this guy and leads him to Christ, and Bob Grenier gets saved. I mean, that's how it works, guys. That's how it always has worked. And then, then God uses the Greg Lorries and the Raw Reeses and the Mike McIntoshes and, and all the rest and so many others that could be named and are worthy of mention. The Billy Grahams, the Franklin Grahams, the Luis Palau's and so many others to just preach a simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm looking for the Lord to move. I want Jesus Christ to move. I, I don't want to look at, at, at a movement and say, oh yeah, I got everybody to vote and that's why America changed. I'm just not there. Forgive me. Maybe you are. I'm not. I believe that I need to be on my face before God for this nation, and I am. I just want Jesus to move. And maybe, see, I get emotional because this is deep in my heart. And I don't talk about it, except with Marie. She hears too much. <laughs> but I watch the church. I love the church. And I love my pastor friends. And we have got to get back on our faces. The church has got to get back to the word of God. We've got to rely on the Holy Spirit. And we need to remember that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have to remember that. And I don't think that we do. I am grateful that my pastor, Chuck Smith, and right around the time when I got saved, I am grateful that he wasn't pushing politics. I am grateful that he wasn't standing up just pushing Richard Nixon. Because when I got saved, Nixon was in office. Chuck wasn't running around saying, oh, you know, this is the man. No. Chuck said, he's the man. Follow him. Your life will be changed. See, no politician ever saved me from drugs. They'll make it possible for me to get some with prescriptions. <laughs> but they don't save me from its power. And they can offer me all kinds of health care, and they can offer me all kinds of insurance but I got the best life insurance and the best fire insurance that anyone can have. I got that from Jesus Christ. And so, as corny as that is, and a lot of people think, oh, David, you're so unsophisticated. You're so stupid. You just don't see. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. You know, but when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to hear, well done, my good, my faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. I want to influence you into the kingdom of God. I want you to love Jesus Christ more than anything, more than anyone. And that's why I love him. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Isaiah 45, 22 through 24 says, Turn unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. I'm God. There is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. So Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow. Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, Sigmund Freud, Mao, Hitler. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess, you are Lord. And you and I will do the same. Except when you and I say it, we're going to say it with love. We're going to say, you're Lord. Because we got used to doing that here on earth. So we're going to say that, I believe, with adoration, with worship, with joy, with recognition. And others will say it because they're going to be forced to, to 
to acknowledge what they denied. Jesus, you are Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. So I have begun practicing here on earth because I'll be doing it when I see him.